Hello, Pastor Gavin Whitcomb Sr. here from Moores Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Are you ready to dig into the Word? I know I am. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your Word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into your truth. We ask you to bless now the uh, study of your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've been going through the book of Colossians, uh, verse by verse study, and we are in chapter 1 right now, and uh, I'd like to read to you verses 12 through 19. We're going to really focus on verses 15 through 19, but it says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So we're really going to pick up where we left off here at verse 15. Who is the image? Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, you know, in this portion of Scripture, um, there is a description of some of the incredible blessings for which we are to offer thanks to God. And the verses that follow describe Jesus, who is our great Savior, that made all these blessings possible. So the church in Colossae was being confronted by false teachings and philosophies that were contrary to the teaching of God's Word. You know, if you look at chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So he, does, he says, hey, don't be carried away captive by this false philosophy that's based on man's teaching. And in, later on in chapter 2, verse 18, he says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So uh, he's writing to confront this false teaching, this false doctrine. And we've said before that it was sort of a mixture of Christianity and, and um, uh, pagan uh, philosophy. And, and so there was a, uh, a philosophy that the Greeks had that matter was evil and spirit was good. And... Um, here, Jesus is uh, called the image of the invisible God. And it's important for the people to see that because uh, these false teachings clouded people's understanding of who Jesus is, either reducing or diminishing him. So the best protection from being uh, deceived is to have a knowledge of the truth. If you know what the truth is, then, and you understand the truth, then you can't be led astray or deceived by falsehood. So therefore, in these verses, Paul reminds them of who Jesus is, God incarnate, the creator of the universe. See, in this dualistic theory of of Greek philosophy that believed matter was evil and spirit was good, people caught up in this would say, well, then Jesus could not have actually become flesh. Uh, he could not have come into flesh and dwelt among us because matter is evil. That's the way they viewed it. Now, this was totally wrong, but to dispel this notion 
The Apostle Paul is emphasizing the incarnation, that Jesus is God, that he was God manifest in the flesh who came to save us. So it says in verse 15, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Now, what does it mean, image? Well, it's the Greek word icon. We get the English word icon from that. An icon is a symbol that represents something. Well, image means likeness or representation and manifestation. It has both those ideas. So sometimes a, a statue of something could be an icon. Um, and man was made in God's image. Uh, we bore a certain likeness to God, a certain representation of what he is like. And one day we will be conformed to the image of God's Son. So the point here is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. God is invisible, right? And in Christ, the invisible God is represented and revealed to us in a way that we could see him. Remember in John chapter 14, Jesus was talking to the disciples, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then he says, he goes on to say, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. So if you've known me, you've known my Father. So Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will satisfy us. You know, it'll... Uh, and Jesus said to him, Have I been so long a time with you? And yet have ye not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. How say ye then, show us the Father? Now being a little guy growing up in church, when I used to hear this verse, I thought that Jesus was saying he was the Father. Well, no, he's not saying that he is the Father. He's saying, if you know the Father, you know me. Because I'm just like the Father, I bear the image of the Father, I'm revealing the Father. And he goes on to say that the Father and the Son, and he speaks about himself, the Son, and the Father as two distinct individuals, but yet the Father is God, the Son is God. This is inner Trinitarian speech here. Jesus' point was, you want to know what the Father is like? Uh, look at me, because I came to reveal and to manifest the Father. And in Hebrews chapter 1, it says this, God who at sundry times and in various manners spoken time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So God spoke by prophets, right? Now he's spoken unto us in these last days by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Okay, so Christ was involved in the creation of the worlds, the ages, right? Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, the exact likeness, the exact representation of God the Father, and upholding all things by the word of his power, that's the work of Christ, right, in creation, upholding creation, sustaining it. When he had by himself purged our sins, it says he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, the right hand of the Father. So he is the image of the invisible, <clears throat> the invisible God. And then it says he's the firstborn of every creature. Now, the word firstborn means preeminent one. It's the Greek word prototakos. Now, there's some who say, oh, this means that he was the first thing that God ever created. Wrong. Uh, if he would have been the first thing that God created, it would, it, they would have used the word prototikos. But it's prototakos, the first in terms of rank the chief preeminent one, the firstborn of all creation or of every creature is the meaning. And and you see, in the ancient uh, Hebrew family and, and probably in the Greek families too as well in that day, if you, I know it's true in Israel and, and in the Jewish way of thinking, the firstborn son was the highest in rank in the family. 
He was the leader of the family. He received a double portion of the father's inheritance. And uh, so, you know, he Jesus being called the firstborn, it means the highest in rank, the preeminent one. The same word firstborn is used to describe him as the firstborn from the dead. Uh, the firstborn of every creature means overall creation. So Christ is the preeminent one, the firstborn, the highest one. And, uh, you know, the, the Jehovah Witnesses try to say, oh, look, he's the first thing ever created. No, then not only does the Greek word not say that, but the next verse indicates that Jesus is the creator of the universe and that he created everything and there are no exceptions. So if he created everything in heaven and earth, he could not be a created being because all things were created by him. Now notice, it says here in Colossians 1 verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Okay, so everything in heaven and everything in earth that was created was created by Christ. Visible and invisible. So things we can see, things we can't see. And whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, which is a reference to the different uh, realms of angels. All things were created by him and for him. Now, let's take a look at this where it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? And Isaiah 44 24 says this Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, and he that formed you from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretches forth the heavens alone, that spreads abroad the earth by myself. So notice Isaiah 44, 24, God creates everything alone by himself. He doesn't have anybody help him. Therefore, anywhere in scripture that, that creation is attributed to somebody, by very nature, they are God. Well, creation is directly attributed to Christ. And this uh, parallels, you know, what we read elsewhere in scripture. The following phrases in this verse make it clear that Jesus was involved in every aspect of creation with no exceptions. Things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, angels, all things were created by him and for him. Now these angels and thrones and dominions and principalities and powers, those words are used to describe not only the holy angels, but also the fallen angels. Initially, they were created as good, but when they sinned, they became, you know, unholy angels. Ephesians 3.10, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So God is demonstrating his wisdom to the principalities and powers in heavenly places to the angels. See, there are different levels of power and authority in the angelic world, in the angelic realm. In Ephesians uh, 6, 12, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, right? In the heavenly realms. So here are the principalities and powers and, and rulers. They are a representative of evil angels. Romans eight thirty seven through 39 says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, this parallels what we read in John 1, 1 through 3, 
Remember the prologue? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then it says this, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now this passage in Colossians 1.16, it's very clear that Jesus is the creator, right? You know what the Jehovah Witnesses do with this in their um, New World Translation? They insert the word other because they know this verse is really, really devastating to their position that Jesus is a created being, and this denies it. So when it says, for by him were all things created, they insert the word, by him were all other things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. All other things were created by him and for him. Why do they falsely, and without the Greek manuscripts supporting it, uh, just arbitrarily, why do they insert the word all other things? Because it's obvious if everything in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, were created by Christ, he's God. So uh, they, they had to uh, kind of change it to accommodate their false teachings and their false doctrines. Now, it, it says here, if he, it, it says, all things were created by him and for him. Now, that's another indication of his deity, that he's God. If everything was created for him, that's the very language that the Bible uses to describe God and his creative work. Here's what I mean. Revelation 4, 9 through 11, pictures a scene in heaven where the living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before his throne and worship God. And they cast their th crowns before the throne and say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. You created everything for your pleasure. See, it's saying that about God. But it's true of Jesus because Jesus is God, the Son. In Romans 11, verse 33, and also verse 36, says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Then it says, For of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. So it says, of him and through him and to him. In other words, everything is for his glory, his purposes. Uh, they're, they're created for him. Uh, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So do you see that, that all things were created by him? They were created for him. Then we find that, verse 18, it says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now what does it mean that he is before all things? Well, what that means is that it refers to his preexistence. It's just like in John 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word was already with God in the beginning, before anything was created that everything was created through him and by him. So the Father, the Son, the Spirit, all three persons of the Godhead were involved in the creation, including Christ. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. Consist means that they're upheld. They're held together. What is it that keeps the universe running? What, where does the each atom get its energy. Um, what is it that keeps atoms from f collapsing or flying apart? God upholds all things by the word of his power. Christ upholds all things. By him all things consist. Now, verse 18 goes on to say, And he, that's Christ, is the head of the body, the church. 
Now here we have the, the concept of the church and Christ is the head of the church. And uh, church here doesn't refer to the building. And in this particular passage doesn't even refer to a local congregation of believers. This is a reference to the church as a whole, the church at large. In other words, all the saved around the world in a collective sense. Christ's spiritual body of people that he has called out from the world to be his own people. You know, the word church is the Greek word ekklesia, and ek means out of, and klesia means uh, an assembly of people, a group of people. So a called out assembly, and you know, it's true that God has called us out from the world to be his very own. This calling is referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness, but under them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So notice the Jews hear it, it's a stumbling block. The Greeks hear it, it's foolishness to them. But are those who are called, that's this inward calling by the working of the power of God and the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. Unto them who are called, whether they're Jew or Greek, uh, the preaching of the cross is Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You know, Romans chapter 1 refers to this calling. He says, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So God calls us to himself and calls us to be his people. That's the meaning in Romans chapter 8, where it says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the what? The called. In other words, the called ones, according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, so God knew us before even the world was created, and he knew we would come to Christ. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So we're going to bear the likeness of God, uh, and, and that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He'll be the preeminent one, the chief one, the protocos, right? Uh, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Now, notice it says, whom he, and whom he called, them he also justified. That means that this calling here, no matter what, if God calls us in this way, we are going to come to him. Everyone who is called in this way ends up being justified. And whom he justified, them he glorified. So he says, whom he called, them he justified. Whom he justified, them he glorified. So this, you know, I, I think some people call this effectual calling. And I, I think of what Jesus said in John six thirty seven. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Notice, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. So if we've been given to him by the Father, we're going to come to him uh, willingly, by our own free will, but being made willing by the working of his grace. Now that's the teaching of Scripture. I'm a Biblicist. So uh, you can put an ist or an ism at the end of my name if you want to. I am a Biblicist. If the Bible teaches that doctrine then I believe it. So the effectual calling <clears throat> of the believer. So he says here, he is the head of the body, the church. Okay, so the church is the body of Christ. We're, we are his called out ones. He's the head of it. Now, this uh, church this church, not the local church, but the church at large in a universal sense, the way that he means it, that Christ is the head of the church. Some refer to this 
as the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic means universal. So the Holy Catholic Church rather than the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so you and I who are saved and born again, we are part of the Holy Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church. So that's the, uh, in, in the Apostles' Creed, which is a, uh, a reflection of what the Apostles taught. Uh, my understanding is it was, uh, it, it was uh, compiled in like the 4th century, but is a good representation of the teaching of the Apostles. It, it says there, and, I, and part of it is, you know, we believe that Jesus was, there's one God the Father, and, and uh, Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate and arose from the dead and <clears throat> ascended to heaven. It says, and we believe in, in, in the Holy Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church, but the Holy Catholic Church, Universal Church. And uh, so that's the way that he means it here. He's the head of the body of the church. Now, let me share with you a few passages of scripture that refer to the church in this universal sense as the body of Christ, of which Christ is the head. Head meaning the leader, uh, the overseer of it. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13 says, As the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 23, talks about how Christ was raised from the dead and set at the right hand of the Father, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that's named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come, and has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. You see, that's the universal church, the holy Catholic church. In other words, all true born-again believers in Christ. Now, if Christ is the head of the church, God the Father put Christ as the head of the church, then you and I who are part of his church, you and I who are believers, we ought to be obedient to the leadership of our head. You know, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 23 through 25, and that chapter describes how marriage is, in, to a certain degree, to be a picture of God's relationship with his people, uh, of Christ and the church. And it says this, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now notice it says there, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, you and I who are part of the church, um, examine your life right now. Have you been subject to Christ? Have you been obedient? Uh, are you allowing him to rule and reign from the throne of your life? Or have you sort of, without maybe realizing it perhaps, nudged Christ off the throne of your heart? Why don't you repent and, and yield back to him the right to rule and reign? He's the head of the church. And we're to, uh, we're to be subject unto him. He is to be the Lord of our life, and we're to do what he says. Now he says here, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Now what does it mean that Christ is the beginning? Well, the beginning means the origin. In other words, everything began with him. It's another way of saying that he's the creator of all things. Let me read to you uh, 
Isaiah 44, verse 6. It says, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Revelation 1, 8, Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Then in Revelation 1, 17 and 18, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And in Revelation 22, 12 through 13, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning. You hear that? The beginning and the end, the first and the last. So it's another way of saying when it says he is the beginning. It means everything originated with him. It started with him. He's the creator. The same is true of it's said of God the Father. Now the next phrase he says here, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. But what does that mean, the firstborn from the dead? Well, it doesn't mean that he's the first one ever to rise from the dead. Because there were people who, you know, Elijah and Elisha raised from the dead. The Apostle Paul raised somebody from the dead. And Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? And also uh, uh, the, the young girl. Uh, so we find then that the firstborn from the dead doesn't mean the first one ever to be raised from the dead, but He's the preeminent one, the chief one, the protocos. And his resurrection is unique in that he died and he rose again, never to die again. I mean, Lazarus died again. So did everybody else in Scripture that was raised from the dead. But not Jesus. And he's the chief one, the preeminent one. That in all things, he might have the preeminence. Preeminence means the highest place, first in rank, you know, like the firstborn. In all things, he might have the preeminence. You see, Jesus came to earth, and he humbled himself for a season in his incarnation and became a man. But now he is exalted, and uh, because he humbled himself and became uh, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Wherefore God also, the Father, hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So because Jesus humbled himself, the Father wants to exalt him and give him the preeminence over all creation. It says here, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. What does that mean, that in him should all fullness dwell? Well, in Colossians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, In him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So what that means is that Jesus was totally and completely man and totally God, fully man Fully God, the fullness of God, dwelt bodily in Christ. This is the mystery of the incarnation. And it's like uh, Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached among the Gentiles, uh, received up in the glory. God manifest in the flesh. It pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may his peace rest and abide and reign and rule in your hearts. Amen.